in the book he wears a ghost in the shell t-shirt and this is all I have close enough so hi everybody you ready for a wild ride because I doubt you have any idea where this is going not unless you've read the book before in which case you're cheating and no you can stay you don't have to leave this is a book called born to bleed which sounds like it should be a book written by women for women about women but it's not this book is by Ryan C. Thomas and it has more turns in it than I don't know a NASCAR something with a lot of turns in it first off I need to lead with the fact that this is a sequel to a book called the summer I died and we will spoil the shit out of that book here so you've been warned our protagonist is named Roger from what I gather because I didn't read the book Roger his sister and his best friend tooth were kidnapped by a person known only as the skinny man the skinny man tortured and killed tooth and Roger's sister before Roger took an axe and planted it into the skinny man's skull our story begins in California in Roger's therapist's office he's having hallucinations of tooth and the skinny man talking to him and just like Charlie in survive the night he chooses to stop taking his medication that stops the hallucinations ah. Roger also has a recurring nightmare where he watches a woman uh, be murdered before killing the man who did it uh, this troubles him because in the dream he never saves the woman he always lets her die first we also learn that Roger is an artist a painter to be specific he sells his paintings at a gallery run by a man named Barry a woman named Victoria also works at the gallery and Roger has a major crush on her only problem is that Victoria has a boyfriend named Gabe can you guys tell that I'm sick because I'm sick I thought it would help add to the look after his appointment Roger gets a call from Barry reminding him that he still has two more paintings to get to the gallery before his showcase coming up Roger stops at a lake to paint where he gets a call from Victoria and she's freaking out because she accidentally spilled coffee on some on one of Roger's paintings Roger invites Victoria to meet him at the lake with the painting and he would fix it she takes him up on this but brings Gabe with her Victoria leaves the boys alone to go buy some fruit at a nearby fruit stand and the boys chat and Gabe reveals that he is going to ask Victoria to marry him the boys notice a group of men in a white SUV staring at Victoria apparently this is nothing new to Gabe because Victoria is very beautiful so he's used to men leering at her all the time Roger fixes the painting and takes a photo of the couple by the lake to paint later as a favor to Gabe he leaves in a hurry and gets halfway home before he realizes that he forgot to finish the painting he had been working on originally Roger races back to the lake and sees that Victoria's car is still parked there he finds that odd because she had been in a rush to get the painting back to the gallery before Barry fired her he also noticed that Gabe's pack of cigarettes was on the ground by the car and what looked like a bloody handprint on the back windshield worried he tried to call the police but couldn't get through he called his cop friend Teddy who lives back east where Roger is originally from and Teddy tells him to try the police again and to follow his gut Roger remembers the men in the white SUV and Teddy explains to him what SUV tracks look like on a hunch Roger follows tracks that he thinks belong to the white SUV it becomes dark and Roger ends up driving through someone's property he stops and the man who owns the property comes out to yell at him his name is Leslie and he's great um, he's just an old man who wants people to stay off his property and he wants to listen to Kelly Clarkson with no problems he's just a standard man from Wyoming I guess except in California anyway uh, Roger apologizes to Leslie and explains that he was following an SUV Leslie mentions that he's pretty sure that there's an SUV parked a few houses down the way Roger parks in front of the house Leslie pointed out to him 
and peeks through the window. And there he sees Gabe tied to a chair while three men take turns assaulting uh, the swimming suit parts of Victoria. While he was out there, Teddy began to call his phone. The ringing alerted the men, and the next thing Roger knew, he was smacked in the face with the shovel. He was dragged into the house, and his phone was smashed. The three men were named Walt, Bob, and Goon Number Three, because we don't know his name. Um, Walt seems to be in charge of the operation, as he is barking orders at the other men. He tells them to clean up Victoria and drive her to the drop-off location while he deals with Gabe and Roger. Walt is a huge goober, and he decides he wants to take his time killing uh, Gabe and Roger, so he makes them dig their own graves to try and psychologically mess with them. After a while, Gabe stops digging and is promptly shot through the neck. Uh, he is left to bleed out on the ground. Walt decides that he wants to bury Roger alive. So, just as Walt is telling Roger to get on his stomach in the hole, a mosquito lands on his nose, and like a big ol' idiot, Walt uses his gun hand to swat the bug away. Roger takes the opportunity to throw the shovel at Walt and launch himself out of the hole on top of him. There's a struggle, and Roger is able to pull the gun away from Walt. Roger shoots Walt through the eye, but Walt keeps coming toward him. Suddenly, Walt is shot in the back of the head by none other than Leslie, the good old boy Leslie. Uh, and he actually meant to shoot him in the leg, apparently. He's like, oh god, I didn't know what I was doing. I'm just out here looking for my kids. I just want to listen to Kelly Clarkson in peace. What's people doing on my property? So Roger takes Walt's phone and gun, and he tells Leslie to call the police, and Roger takes off to find Victoria. He drives back to Victoria's car and looks around and looks through the phone that he took from uh, Walt. Uh, the last number, or the last call was made to a number saved as Goldilocks. Roger tells Teddy to uh, trace the number, which he does, and it traces back to a payphone. Roger drives and finds the payphone in front of a liquor store. When Roger goes inside to question the owner about who was using the payphone, he finds one of his paintings hanging up inside. The owner reveals that Barry, the gallery owner, had given him the painting in exchange for booze one day, and yes, Barry had used the payphone that night. Roger hops back in his car and drives around a nearby neighborhood until he finds Barry's car. Roger forces Barry to show him the address where the goons had taken Victoria. Roger happens to be familiar with the name on the address because uh, the man named Marshall is a prominent member of the community. There is another struggle and Roger is forced to shoot Barry in the head. Before Roger takes off to the address, he calls Teddy and relays the address to him, telling him to send cops out that way. The cops show up to the house before Roger and appear to just be leaving and after shaking hands with the man at the door. Uh, clearly they had thought that they had been pranked or something. Roger sneaks into the backyard and into a nearby gardening shed where he hears sobbing coming from the floor. He finds a secret hatch on the floor, but it's locked. And before Roger can find a way to open it, goon number three catches him. And the two men fight before Roger plants a pair of gardening shears into his neck. Get it? He plants the pair of gardening shears into his neck. He plant and garden. Get it? Do you get it? Roger makes his way into the unlocked house dodging four to five armed guards along the way. He makes his way upstairs and finds a ledge where he spies down on a dining room full of people. Uh, Marshall seems to be hosting some kind of dinner party. Suddenly, two guards bring in a naked woman, not Victoria, and they chain her up to the dining table. And the older people around the table praise someone called Velis before they proceed to eat the young woman alive. And I mean, it is a gory scene. They rip this woman apart. 
they pry out her eyeballs, they crack open her skull to eat the brain, which you're not supposed to do, you're not supposed to eat brain. Don't know why, but I know it's bad for you. After they're finished, Marshall announces that they will be having a special dessert to please Velis. But first, they are going to have drinks in the observatory. Roger narrowly misses the party as they head up the hallway, or up the stairs. Remember all this time he's having hallucinations of the skinny man and Tooth talking to him and taunting him back and forth. And he makes the decision that once he gets home, he is getting back on his meds, which is great. It's a lot better than Charlie. Charlie can kick rocks. Roger explores the house some more, passing by some strange wolf statues and finds a secret door in the basement. He heads through a dirt tunnel to a room filled with cages. In one cage, he finds Victoria. He shoots the lock on the cage and frees her. As they make their way to the exit, Bob, one of the rapists from before, ambushes them, and uh, there's a shootout between Roger and Bob before Roger notices a mysterious man watching from the shadows. The main security guard, named Ben, sneaks up and helps wrangle Roger and Victoria back into the room with the cages. Ben locks Roger in one cage and takes Victoria with him after sedating her. So Bob, looking to get revenge, decides to shoot Roger in the arm and then attempts to inject Roger with the sedative. Uh, when he tries to do this, Roger kicks his legs up and causes Bob to stab himself in the chin with the needle. Roger notices the mysterious man again, just watching, as he escapes the cage and shoots Bob in the dick before re-entering the house to look for Victoria. Roger makes it up to the observatory and finds Victoria strapped to the table. Just as he is about to ambush the party, Ben grabs him from behind. Marshall forces Roger to sit and watch them eat Victoria. And just as she wakes up, the party begin to stab Victoria. And in a moment of blind rage and super strength, Roger flips the entire table with Victoria on it and begins a shootout with four to five armed guards moving through the house. Finally, it's just Ben left, and Roger finds himself on the ledge overlooking the dining room once again, and decides to throw a book down below to draw Ben out. The book bounces next to the fireplace and immediately catches fire. Ben makes his way up to where Roger is, and there's a brief struggle, and after a brief struggle, Roger is able to flip Ben over the banister and into the fire below. Ben is burned alive. Roger makes it back upstairs and threatens the party guests with a gun forcing them to help unchain Victoria, who is covered in blood and needing to lean on Roger to walk. They attempt to escape the house, but the fire has built up, and the only way to escape is back through the room with the cages. When they reach the basement, they are stopped by the party guests, now all donning wolf masks and carrying various sharp objects. They surround the couple. But just as they are about to attack, Roger hears Tooth's voice, telling him to jump out of the way. He does right before a large section of ceiling crashes down, crushing and burning the party alive. Roger and Victoria finally make it out of the house and back to Roger's car. Roger drives for as long as he can before he finally passes out due to blood loss. He crashes into a building, and the next thing he knows, he's waking up in a hospital with doctors and police surrounding him. He's lucky to be alive, and so is Victoria. He's questioned thoroughly before Victoria and good old Leslie come to corroborate his story. After a few days, he's released from the hospital and returns home to find him the mysterious man from before in his apartment. He introduces himself and explains that he has been watching Roger for a long time. Roger has a gift. His destiny is to deal with such evils as the cult and the skinny man. You mean I'm born to bleed, says Roger. So that was cute. The man wants to offer Roger a place in his company, and to prove his point, the man produces a gun with a silencer on it. He shoots each side of the couch that Roger is sitting on, but when he tries to fire it at Roger, the gun jams. Our story ends with Roger agreeing to join the man's uh, X-Men type team. And that was Born to Bleed. I told you it was a wild ride. 
Uh, I thought this book was very good, very action-packed, very gory, and completely unhinged. Uh, thank you guys so much for checking out my channel, and please subscribe if you're into that sort of thing. Thanks. Bye.